Hi, welcome to Call on the Midwife. It's my day to share. And I thought I would share just a couple of little tips about pregnancy and childbirth from some of my manuals. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is from my midwife assistant orientation manual. How are you today? I hope you're well. I'm just gonna find my... So the first one I wanted to talk about is um, what kinds of things you would need to know if you were gonna be helping um, anybody who was helping somebody in a low resource setting to deliver a baby, okay? So that could mean, like say, um, say we have a, um, a disaster where there's, you know, um, people gathering in, in buildings and stuff like that. Oftentimes there'll be babies born in those buildings. Um, another thing that can happen is when you have a really serious pandemic, we've had, you know, kind of a very mild pandemic in our area, but I know in other parts of the world, like India and New Zealand and England and places like that, that they've had some serious death counts. And, um, I mean, I know we've had them here too, but I think it, it, um, it can be much, much worse where the hospitals, excuse me, where it gets to the point where the hospitals are just not not the safest place to have your baby, right? So <clears throat> what I want to do today is just help prepare people. This is my whole mission and my whole goal is to help prepare people to be able to assist sometimes maybe as a primary care provider for somebody in a non, um, you know, hospital location where you would have to respond to childbirth in a safe and unobstructive way. And so because we've been so conditioned, preconditioned for fear and preconditioned with a lot of faults, um, well, just a lot of bad information from Hollywood and other places, and especially from our system, we're not as prepared for people to have birth in those out of hospital settings. So what we need to do is just learn some basic simple things. So I'm going to share with you today some things that um, have to do with emergency procedures, okay? Now, midwives are trained in low resource childbirth and except for if they're a hospital midwife then they don't always get trained in the out of hospital childbirth. So this course, these courses I do are for doctors, midwives, nurses, and lay people. So anybody can take this information in and learn it because it's so different from what the response would be in the hospital where you've got IVs, you've got drugs, you've got an anesthesiologist, you can do cesareans, you know, you know, your whole way of approaching the, the natural event, um, which is really basically a physiological event. It's not a medical event and traditionally has been done in the home for most of the time we've lived on this planet, <laughs> except for a few, uh, you know, the last few thousand years or, you know, a few hundred years. And actually we have terrible outcomes now because of that. So um, I'm not necessarily advocating that everybody have a home birth, but in a time of crisis, when there's civil unrest, whether it's, um, you know, severe plagues and infection rates in the hospital. We know there's a higher infection rate in the hospital, even under normal conditions than at home. And every home birth study that's ever been done has proved that home birth is safer than hospital, except for, uh, well, except for the infection rate um, is lower at home. It's about the same really, but the, but the home birth is, is the lower infection rate for low risk women, of course, high risk women, that's different, but even high risk women, I think can do better at home. So-called high risk women. I mean, I used to do V back vaginal births after cesareans all the time and, and they were always successful. And there's a lot of sort of, I'm not saying they're always successful, but I think they can be if they're not induced and not artificially pampered with, because when the natural hormone cocktails happen and everything happens in its natural order, things flow 
and labor flows. When there's interventions, that's when you get more complications. Okay, so what are some of the things that you might want to be prepared to know as either a student midwife or a another person that might be helping out a midwife? Well, one of the things is to know how to assess a baby's lungs. Okay, so I'm just going to start with that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the newborn. Okay, so one of the things that we want to make sure is that the newborn is going to be able to survive, right? Now this baby has its cord wrapped like this. because <laughs> There we go. This is my little homemade placenta. And so what I wanted to just share with you about this is that um, one of the things that's really good to know is how to assess a baby's respiration, the rate, the perfusion in the lungs, and if it's in both lung fields. So when you have a baby flat on their back, either on the, or, you know, on the mother's chest, tummy, or on the mother's back, or right on the floor in front of the mom, wherever close to the mom, because you don't want to cut the cord. The cord's the lifeline to the baby. This has, you know, up to half the blood supply of the child in it at the time of the delivery. So you don't want to do a bloodletting. That's not good this causes a lot of brain challenges anyway so you want to be able to report assess and report the lung perfusion so how do you do that so well one of the things is by just observation you can that's why you don't want anything on top of the baby you might dry the baby off and then remove the blanket because you want to be able to have full view of the baby's chest the baby's central part of the baby's body should be pink um, at the beginning of the when the first is baby the sorry when the baby is first born the baby will usually be purple or blue and that's normal that's natural but as the baby starts to breathe usually within the first minute they'll transition they're still getting oxygen so don't panic if they're not breathing in the first minute just keep observing dry them off keep them skin to skin get the mother to talk to the baby and you know stimulate the baby you can stimulate the feet the hands you can turn the baby over like this into a um, supported um, inverted um, position like this and you can do just a couple strokes up the back spine and that'll help the baby to cough up any mucus that's in there and then you can take a little cloth wipe the mouth and nose off okay and then you can um, you know whatever is happening say you're assisting I'm just saying if you're observing the breasts you can be observing the chest rising on both sides this the right and the left um, and then you could also count them and see how many there is in a minute and there should be 40 to 60 respirations per minute with a newborn and if you had a stethoscope you know I mean maybe you do maybe you maybe you're a nurse or maybe you're a doctor or maybe you're just a doula or a student midwife or whoever and you want to learn these skills well get yourself a good pediatric stethoscope my favorite one is is um the lit one really this is a different one but lit one is my favorite because it's such good quality but you know there's others so a good infant stethoscope and then you know how to use a stethoscope where you have these facing towards your nose so for best hearing and then what you would do is you would listen in all four quadrants of the lungs if you were doing a full exam to see if the baby's you know breathing and all getting full perfusion but for just the purpose of like um, this course or this information that I'm trying to give which is really simple um, just if you had one of these and you had it placed on here um, the bell portion can be really accurate um, and you you place it on here and you can just you can hear not only the heartbeat but you can also hear the lungs so you can put it on this side you can hear the lungs the air going through that side and then you can hear the air going through that side so it might be like somebody's giving respiration so breathe two three breathe two three breathe two three and you're putting your mouth over the baby's nose and mouth and you're pushing just the amount of breath that you have in your cheeks 
slowly like you'd blow into a balloon. And um, so then you would be checking the respirate, checking to make sure visually that the chest is rising. And then maybe in between, um, if you know the person might take a break, say you're working with somebody else or it's you, maybe it's you, then you stop and you take the stethoscope and you listen so you can really hear, is the baby breathing on her own? No, it's not, it's not breathing on her own. But it's, it's, it's filling the lungs while I'm doing the breath so then you keep doing the rescue breaths. Breathe, two, three, breathe, two, three, breathe, two, three. You can teach the mom to do it. If you, for some reason, are really not comfortable to do that mouth to mouth, because I mean, there are bags that we use as midwives, we do for universal precautions, but they're hard to learn how to use actually, and they can be less effective and they're harder to get a seal with than your own mouth. And so it's just a little bit harder to tell what you, what's happening. And you can also push it too hard. You can put too much lung breath in and it can burst the baby's lungs. So you really, the baby's lungs are like that big, right? Okay. <laughs> so that's just a little bit about um, helping a baby breathe and assessing the lungs um, for full perfusion. Okay. And that would mean like where you would assess them is in these upper quadrants here and then again down here in the lower quadrants. And in midwifery, we also check the back four quadrants as well. Okay, so let's move on. Know the location and the mechanics of an oxygen setup. I think that's important. I'm not going to go into that here. I have courses and stuff that you can take on that. But um, I mean, midwives carry oxygen. And it's nice if you are a student midwife, especially to know how to operate an oxygen machine. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes um, that we might want to set up an IV in a home. Now, in the low resource setting, most of the time with the kind of teaching that I'm doing now, where it's more like a, a 911 birth response course, we don't teach about IVs or anything like that. But say if you did have somebody there who knew how to do it and had the equipment, I mean, we have, I think right now we have probably close to 10, perhaps more midwives in this Snake Valley, River Valley here. But we couldn't begin to um, manage the need for um, support if there was a real true pandemic here where, I mean, a, a serious one that affected the hospitals. And so they would have to split up. They couldn't go in teams of two, which they often like to do. They'd have to split up and it would be great if they had people with them that knew a little bit more than just the average lay person. And okay, so knowing how to set up an IV is just really a hanger. A, a metal hanger is one of the best things for setting up an IV and you can hang it on, you know, a, a hook on the ceiling or, um, a, you know, a shower knob or something like that. There's, you know, you usually you can find something in the room. Okay, so let's move along. Um, how to evaluate maternal blood loss and placenta delivery. Do controlled cord traction and guard guarding of the fundus. So those are some things um, that would be good for you to know how to do. So uh, evaluating maternal blood loss is really something that you could do at home. Um, you can actually make this pretending blood and you can get checks, pads and cloths and towels. And then you can have somebody else measure like a quarter of a cup, a cup, a cup and a half, two cups, three cups, four cups. Now two cups is kind of what we would call in our um, standard of care as a parameter for what is within normal range between, you know, half a cup to a cup to two cups of blood is around what you know, 500 cc's. But some women maybe can't lose quite that much and they might start already fainting. So you have to watch the woman and the amount of blood. Like what, how is she responding to what's happening to her? Maybe she, especially if you don't know her blood work and you're with her and you, you actually don't know if she's had um, any anemia in her pregnancy, which you might not have that information if you're in a low resource setting and responding to birth. And so what can you do? Well, you know, um, the anemia 
is um, if if somebody needs to actually have support in the in the sense of um, blood loss, what what you're going to find is that say if someone was anemic, then they might only lose like a cup and a half of blood, but they're already fainting and look like their eyes are rolling black in their head. So what you want to do is try to keep them awake, try to keep them present, try to keep them engaged so they stay alert, and then try to stop the bleeding as fast as you can. So one of the things to do is to, if the placenta has, to, if the placenta has not delivered, then that's your first line of business is getting that out. Because when, if the placenta is inside, it can cause the, the um, uterus to stay bloated and boggy and there can be blood clots building up inside there. So what you want to do is you want to support the mom as much as you can to get the placenta out that might involve um, standing her up. I talked about it in detail on my last video so you can go and read and watch that again. Anyway so um, but the other thing you want to do is you want to get her up have the placenta and then but once that placenta is out okay that's when you can massage and you can go in there and you can really massage the uterus and find out where is that uterus you know where is it You'll, you'll, your landmarks are the belly button, the pubic bone, and then the two sides of the woman. And you just want to, you want to find that. You want to massage till you find it. And then you want it as a hard grapefruit centrally underneath the umbilical, underneath her belly button. That's where it's supposed to be if it's hard and firm and clamping down. Keeping the baby with the mother, keeping the energy quiet, keeping the energy positive. Um, keeping the mom and baby skin to skin will all help to keep the hormone cocktail out. When the hormone cocktails up, the mother's breasts are, will produce better. The, the uterus will clamp down. The placenta will come out. She won't bleed as much. Everything will be better. So keeping the baby near the mom, letting mother led, laid back breastfeeding. I will go into that in another video. I think that's one of the ones I'm going to do next, actually, is laid back breastfeeding because it's so important for... Um, Successful breastfeeding and successful latch, which are critical in the low resource setting where you must breastfeed or the child in most cases will not make it, especially the wind just made the door slam when I said that. Um, confirmations from the divine on everything. It's true. So you do, you want to make sure that you are um, prepared to help a woman who is, you know, in these kind of conditions, because we don't know when they could ever, you know, develop. And when it does develop, it's almost too late for people to start preparing. So why I'm doing this training is, is because of that. So once the placenta has delivered and you're in there and you've got a nice hard grapefruit, the hormone cocktails are all perfectly functioning. You know, you've got the atmosphere quiet. You've got the light low, lighting low. You've got her husband there whispering loving words into her ears. And you're saying positive affirmations and looking at the baby and, you know, affirming positively. If the baby isn't breathing, you're going to do what we, you know, take steps that we talked about, dry the baby off, um, do postural drainage position if necessary, the massage from the base of the spine to the neck several times, wipe off the baby's mouth. And you've already dried the baby off, changed the linen so the baby stays dry and doesn't get drafts. You keep the room as warm as possible. You don't have a lot of loud noises or people around. And the baby and the mother are always together. They are never separated. Okay. And then, um, so, and then controlled, uh, doing correct controlled cord traction. I'll just explain that. That's a really simple thing. We never really want to pull on the cord. Why? Because we could actually rip it. We could not only rip the cord, but we could pull away the placenta before it's actually fully disengaged from the from the from its in complete connection to the inside of the womb. So that is a natural thing that happens as the uterus contracts. All these, you know, all this part of it, it goes smaller and smaller, and this just comes away. Okay, that's the natural part as the uterus contracts. That as we keep the hormone cocktail up. Mom and baby are together. She's letting the baby do, you know, baby, mother-led breastfeeding. Um, you know, so it's kind of cooperative, I would say, mother and baby together. But the, the mother or the midwife or the care provider is not in there 
push, pushing the nipple in the baby's mouth. Nothing like that ever. Um, and the mom is really patient and we're all really patient while that happens because the patting, the licking, the baby's head bobbing, it's all creating the hormone cocktail just fantastically designed. So we don't want to interrupt that sensitive imprinting and bonding process, which is important for baby's nervous system development and uh, trauma-free life and intact capacity to love and trust. And for the mother to have low, low risk of postpartum depression and to have more of a bond with her child and more successful postpartum period and life in general. So, okay. So cord, con cord traction is basically what you're doing is you're just doing, you can actually have the mother, you can teach the mother how to do this where she just feels, Oh, okay. I feel where that is. It's just, it gives her kind of a place to, to, to see, cause she's so numb down there. She's had, you know, a baby come out. Right. So this is a way that she can just, ah, just feel where that is. And then that will help her push. And if you've got her in a supported standing squat with two people, one person on each side, maybe even someone behind her and a bowl or a pot or a toilet or something underneath, then you can help her and she can kind of guide the placenta just very gently. Now, she, if it doesn't, if nothing happens, then you just leave it. But if, if, if she goes like that and you start seeing it lengthen, you start seeing the length of the placenta, like you, you kind of guide your eyes and you, you, you train your eyes to know where that placenta is. You train your eyes to know where her opening of her vagina is and you know about where that placenta is like for example say the placenta is like to here maybe that's a pretty short one but say to here well you kind of have this idea you know where it is and then when it lengthens you know or this way rather when it lengthens this way you're going to start to um realize that the placenta must be just up there a little bit and then especially if when you do just gentle traction you, you start feeling it move and then with her pushing and her own effort and gravity, then you're going to have a placenta in no time. Okay. Um, and then guarding the fundus. Now that's the part that I want to explain too, which just goes along with this exactly. So anytime you're pulling on that, even just the slightest bit, just the slightest bit, you're not pulling, you're not really pulling. You're just sort of doing gentle traction. Well, what you want to do is you want to put your hand, here's the mother's pubic pubis, mons pubis. Okay. Here's where the baby came out. The mons pubis is here. Here's the pubic bone right here. You want to put your hand right here and you want to push in there and you just want to gently, you don't want to rub or mess around or anything, but you're just guarding the uterus so that as you're pulling, it's holding it up. You're not going to have it come out with that. Cause sometimes it can, you have to be careful. Um, so you're guarding the uterus and then you're allowing it to come. Okay. Let's see what else. Now, being prepared to help with any kind of med medications for a hemorrhage. Okay, like a typical medication that a midwife would use is a vial of oxytocin, 10 units. And that would be injected either into the arm or into the leg. Like knowing how to do an injection might be a good thing. If we have the drugs, those would be probably helpful. Um, but also, there's a lot of schools of thought, I mean... I know Diane Bjarnson of the MCU Midwifery School has practiced for probably, I don't know, 50 years or something. And she doesn't carry oxytocin and doesn't use it. And she knows how to get hemorrhage to stop just as well as the other women do. And I know I've practiced like that for 15 years in Canada. We didn't carry it. And even when we started carrying it, we never used it because we were so used to just getting it to stop with herbs and manual you know, massage. So we, um, you know, we need to learn to be prepared to help if those things are available. And if the people that we're working with have them, because it's nice, you know, to have drugs if you do need them, but also to know what tinctures work. So blue and black cohosh are really, um, typical herbs used at a birth to help with multiple things to get the labor going and sometimes to stop um, bleeding as well. Um, we're going to be doing a course on that, so I'm not going to go into the tinctures, but we have a course coming up the third week of September with Zoe Bartholomew. She's going to be doing a tincture kit in an ammo box for emergency response to birth. 
Um, and I think that that's all I'm going to go over. I've done five of the 12 points of, um, you know, some things that we felt were really important to know as a, as an assistant to the midwife or whoever you're helping. I hope you have a fantastic day and bless you in your learning and your study. Take care.